Okay, so here's what we want to talk about. We want to talk about, you see here, how God has done all these things, whether it's Mick's story or Ron's story or Lisa's story or uh, Carol and Cammie. And I think here's the thing, that God has done an incredible thing to bring all of us here. Uh, and, and what I want you to see is that God meets, sometimes meets people in the most unlikely of places and sometimes the most unlikely of people. I mean, see, that's the thing about today's story that I want to share with you is, is what I want to share with you today is the story of a man who is probably like the furthest candidate from salvation that you could imagine, and yet Jesus came to meet him. That gives me hope, and I hope it gives you hope here today too. And so I just want to read you the story about a man named Zacchaeus, and this is how it went. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look, here, I now, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times that amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, at first glance, you may say, well, that doesn't seem like a whole lot, but, but this is an incredible story that should never have happened. Because you see, Zacchaeus, by all um, standards that we read about here, was one of the last people that should have been admitted into God's family. And, and the reason being is he had three strikes, right? First, he was a chief tax collector, right? Now, now in those days, if you don't know this, that, that tax collectors were Jewish people but they were hired by the Romans, which was kind of the enemy. They kind of sold out to the government, right? Uh, the government was corrupt, unlike today, of course. And uh, so, not going there, not going there. But, but the thing was that, um, that for Zacchaeus, I mean, just because he was a chief tax collector, the Jewish people shunned him. He was rejected by society. And so he wasn't welcome. And that's how he viewed himself, as someone who just wasn't welcome. The other thing, he was very wealthy. And the reason he was wealthy is because in those days, tax collectors would, re would collect a required amount, and then they require and collect a little extra so that they could skim some off the top. And so he basically uh, got wealthy by cheating the Jewish people. So strike two. And the third, he was short. Now, this is not pointed out because of all the short people here, just so you know. In fact, just, this is not a Randy Newman moment, okay? So this is... You don't even know what that means. Uh, but I just know that, that for him, though, that he was at a disadvantage. And that's why when the crowds came, I mean, Jesus was quite popular by now. And when the crowds came, he just couldn't see. And see, most would have given up. But Zacchaeus was, was so desperate to see Jesus. What does he do? He climbs up a tree just so he can see Jesus. Now, you may not think he was desperate, right? You may think, well, why? He had everything going for him. But see, here's the thing. There was a hole in his soul. Because he may have had money, he may have had status, he may have had his titles. Um, being short is not that big a deal, just so you know. But the thing was that for him, for him, there was something missing. There was something missing. And, and, and now he sees Jesus and he, and he wonders, is Jesus the answer? Is Jesus going to be any different than any other religious leader of his time? And just for one moment, just in this one moment, this man who you think would have everything realized that he didn't have everything. In fact, there's this hole in his soul, but yet, yet when, he, when he saw Jesus, he wanted to know more. He had something that, that had eluded him for so long, he had maybe just a glimmer of hope that maybe Jesus would be different. And, and Jesus doesn't disappoint. See, that's the beauty of this, right? Okay, now just picture this, okay? So Jesus is now going through town, crowds are all around him, and it says he stopped at a spot. He stopped at a spot. It's almost like it was planned, and I think it was, by Jesus, nobody else. And the people are clamoring around him, and there, there's people wanting to just get close to him, and, there, and there's a lot of people there, and all of a sudden he stops, and he looks up. Now, if you're Zacchaeus, this is the oops moment, 
Because there's nowhere he can go. It's not like he can hide behind a leaf, right? I mean, he's, he's there. He's there. Everyone sees him. Jesus sees him. And not only is Jesus looking at him now, I'm sure everyone else is doing this. And there he is. He's right in front of God and everybody, and he doesn't know what to do. And, and, and so here's what you, you think. Okay, now Jesus is going to lower the boom. And, and what happens next is just unheard of. Because Jesus, when he reaches the spot, he looks up and says, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. And you think, oh boy, oh boy, this is it. Jesus is going to lower the boom. Jesus is going to tell him he has no business being there. Jesus is going to tell him he doesn't belong. But this is what Jesus is next. This is the part no one saw coming. And I think least of all Zacchaeus, Jesus says to him, I must stay at your house today. Oh my gosh. You see, no religious person had come into, Jesus, or into Zacchaeus' house. And now Jesus is saying, I must come. Can you imagine? I mean, just think about it. Okay, think of this. Think of, you're at home, right? You're at home and you're doing whatever you're doing at home, and all of a sudden there's a knock on the door. And you open the door, it's Jesus. What are you going to do? I mean, Jesus, Jesus says, <laughs> Come on in. What do you got to lose, right? Right, because Jesus is standing. He's knocking the door. By the way, the Bible talks about that a lot. Jesus is standing. He's knocking the door. Will you let him in? And, and I don't know if Zacchaeus thought, oh, my gosh, do I have any food at home today? I mean, is the house, the house, is the house messy today? I mean, do I need to call DoorDash? I don't know what he thinks. <laughs> I don't know what he thinks. But, you know, see, here's the part about it. It doesn't matter. Jesus doesn't say, you got to have everything cleaned up. Jesus doesn't say, you got to have everything just right. Jesus doesn't say, I, I hope that there are appropriate things in your home. Jesus doesn't say this. He says, I must come. I must stay at your house. And I must come immediately. And then it says that Zacchaeus welcomes him with joy. It says he welcomes him gladly. And, and a lot of translations say, say joyfully, others say exuberantly. I mean, it, it's just so amazing because they see where this encounter changed for Zacchaeus? As you notice, when Jesus saw him, he called him by name. That's really important. And you say, well, he probably heard it from somebody else. Maybe, maybe not. But it was important for Jesus that Zacchaeus knew that he knew his name. And so now the God of all heaven and earth comes and wants to be with Zacchaeus. I'm, I'm sure Zacchaeus is like, you, you want to come to my house? You want to come and be with me? Oh, by all means. And now all of a sudden, a, a, a very awkward encounter, a very potentially embarrassing encounter, now turns into a life-changing encounter. But here's the problem. As soon as this encounter happens, the Bible says all the people saw this and they began to mutter. You knew they would. There's always somebody. Every party has a pooper, and this was this, this was what it was right here. Right? He's gone to be the guest. What do they say? They don't say of Zacchaeus. They don't say of the chief tax collector. They don't say of the wealthy man. He's come to be the guest of what? A sinner. You see, that's how he saw him. That's how the people saw Zacchaeus. He was nothing more than a sinner to them. He wasn't a person of value. He wasn't a person who was precious to God. He was a sinner. But you see what Jesus saw when he saw Zacchaeus? He saw something completely different. He saw someone who mattered to God. And, and, and so here's the thing. Good for Zacchaeus because you know what? Today only one voice mattered. I mean, he could have just said, oh my gosh, everyone's mad, everyone's muttering, everyone's saying these things, I better not. I don't want to embarrass Jesus. I don't want to do anything. But Zacchaeus, to his credit, only sees Jesus, and he welcomes him gladly. Hebrews says this, is that this is what the Holy Spirit says, if only you would listen to his voice this day. And that's exactly what Zacchaeus did. And then he does something even more unheard of, right? Because everyone's starting to question, well, this isn't really legit. He's just trying to be nice and let Jesus come to his house and look good. He, what's the first thing he says? He doesn't say, oh, yeah, come on, I've got a great big banquet. No, first thing he says, first thing he says to him, Lord, look, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And why is that such a big deal? Because if people question, they said, oh, yeah, it's just talk. Now he's put something behind it. He's put a little skin in the game here, right? 
he has actually given away half of all his possessions. Jesus is so touched. And by the way, that's the first thing I noticed is that when God gets a hold of somebody, one of the things that changes first is their pocketbook and what they do with their funds, with their money. Because you see, for Zacchaeus, this was a concrete expression of face existence. It was the clearest example that, that change had occurred, that there was something different. Jesus saw it, the people saw it, Zacchaeus saw it. And he realized that things needed to change. Jesus says this in Matthew. He says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. See, that's the thing. You know, whoever wants to gain his life will lose it. In other words, so oftentimes we hold on so tightly to things. Why? We hold on so tightly to things because we're so afraid that we're going to lose them. And we do so, we hold on so tightly that, that it squeezes the life out of us. Because we're no longer living by trust or faith. I, I loved what Dan and Jen shared earlier, right? And they're talking about Dan, and even when Dan said, you know, there was a time when he had nothing, and a church goes and buys him a van. I wanted to give Dan the name of a few people, but I didn't think that was good. Today. But, you know, just, just think that God would do that. And, and, and what is it? Because the church knew, look, this, this is something we need to give away. And now that's their attitude. And I look at that, and I think, I, I think what a difference. Because when God gets a hold of us, it changes our priorities. It changes the things that we hold on to so tightly. And we realize that they're a gift of God, and we can let go of them. And Zacchaeus knew that his big thing was his money. He knew that was the first thing that Jesus would take him, see and know that he would take him seriously. So, Lord, look, look, look. I give away half my possessions. Then when I've cheated, four times the amount. That's a lot, by the way. Um, this last Thursday, I, was, um, I went down to San Jose. Uh, Amy Felix, I don't know if you know Amy. She grew up in our church. She used to be Amy Vander Aiden. She's married now. She's our architect for our new building project. Uh, just had her baby. Just had her baby, Juliet, a beautiful little girl. And uh, I, I went down to San Jose uh, just to go to the hospital and, and see her and Mitch and, and Juliet. Uh, by the way, that, that is my, one of my favorite things to do as a pastor. I will drop anything to see a new baby it's because, to be honest, it's my therapy. It's really, you cannot hold a brand new baby and not everything's right with the world. Right? So a little selfish, but it was so fun because if you know Amy and Mitch, they are go-getters. They are sharp, boy, they, they get it done, and they are hard workers. And, and when I was there, one of the things, first things Mitch said to me is he said, you know, now that she's here, I realize that all this hard work, now I can relax. <laughs> he was talking about job-wise, just so you know, because I said, buddy, you won't relax for 20 years. And now... <laughs> But he said, but he said, he says, but he said, you know what? He said, I just feel like, I just feel like I've got different priorities now. And I thought that was so awesome because, because it was just a very sincere commentary. I mean, they were over the moon, I know. And yeah, no, I know you all say, oh, the things are just beginning, right? But at the same hand, there was a whole change and a shift. And what was really important is they held this baby girl. They realized that there was new life. And that because of that new life, that things were going to have to be different around the Felix household. And see, that's the whole point. Jesus comes, and we realize that if Jesus is really going to be embraced, if we are really going to open the door and let him into our home, that there are going to have to be some things that change. There's going to have to be some messes that get cleaned up. There's going to have to be um, some priorities that need to be different. And it's going to affect every area of our lives, where we spend our time, what we do with our money. The list goes on and on. But the important thing is that we listen to Jesus' voice and Jesus' voice alone. Because there will be a lot of people who will mutter. There will be a lot of people who tell us they have different priorities. But you see, for this man, this day, it was a matter of new priorities. Jesus said it well when he said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And why is that? Because money never satisfies if money is the whole reason for our existence, we are going to fall woefully short. I, I, I know um, that when we had this Imagine More 
campaign this last fall, right? Just the beginning of all our property. I tell you, I am really uncomfortable about talking about money. Because I, for two reasons. One is, one is that every time I talk about money, there's always someone says, see, I told you. I told you, the church is only after their money. I get that all the time. Yeah. See, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it, right? And, and usually when someone says that to me, I say, good, we don't want your money. Don't, just don't. That always throws them off. It's kind of fun. But, um, but then the second thing is I realize that probably the other reason is because I'm, I'm uncomfortable. This is probably one of the greatest struggles of my own life. Right? Um, I, I just, you know, there are times where I just don't feel like I, I've given enough. Or there are times where I just feel like I, I just have not been responsible enough. And, and all those, those things are true, but, but, but I, I, I know this, is that, that when I started talking to people during this whole match of more, and we started talking very openly, I can't tell you how many conversations I had. And by the way, this is not a money pitch right now. I, I can't tell you how many conversations I had from people that said this. They said, you know, we just thought about what we believe that God's wanting to do in this church and how important this Imagine More is. And so we just prayed about it, and, and we've just decided just to trust God to provide. And so we're going to do this. I said, how's that working for you? And, 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 and I, more than once, the conversation has always gone this way, without exception, by the way. We have never felt more free. And I just realized that, that it's not about the money. It's about the trust. Trusting God to do something that we can't do on our own. And I'm not here to say that financial problems aren't real. I'm not here to say that, that oh, you know, just buck it up, suck it up, buttercup. I'm, I'm not saying any of that. What I am saying is that, that just as God brought Dan and Jen through a hard situation, and, and I can tell you story after story here, right, where God has provided that we are trusting God to do something great in the life of this church, and we trust God to provide. And, and I tell you, I will never again apologize for speaking about generosity. That's what God's been speaking to me all week. I will never apologize for that again because this is not about me or, or a building. This is about God setting our hearts free just as he did for Zacchaeus that day. There was a change. And that was significant that he told the Lord that he was giving half his money away. Because I think that when we are generous, we lose Satan's hold on our tight-fisted ways. We hold so tight. We squeeze the life out of life itself, and God says, let it go. Give me your fear. Give me your anxiousness. Give me your mistrust. And trust me. Reminds me of the hymn, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And, and, and so after Zacchaeus says this, Jesus says to him, today salvation has come to this house. Now, did Jesus say that because all of a sudden now Zacchaeus is a good tither? No, Jesus didn't say that because of that. Jesus saw that money had lost its grip, and it was no longer Zacchaeus' God. You cannot serve two masters. Nothing was held back from Jesus. And so I have to think, what am I holding back from Jesus? And it may not be money. For a lot of us, there are many things that we're holding back from Jesus. Forgiveness or trust, or our time, or our priorities. And Jesus just sums it up this way. He just says, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. The big question is, who are the lost? Well, well we are, aren't we? We are the lost. And why do we need Jesus to save us? I, I looked in uh, dictionary.com about the definition of loss, and I saw one of my favorite definitions. It, it said, to be lost is having gone astray or missed the way. Having gone astray or missed the way. And you know what? We've all done that. We've all made choices that have pulled us further from God, that has dis dishonored God. We've all been misdirected. We've all not paying attention. We all put our faith in something that, that isn't going to um, fulfill us. You know, this last week, right? I don't know about you, 
but my week kind of started off the same way as everybody else. You know, uh, a lot of you were here at church last week, and then what did most of you do? How many of you watched the dreaded Super Bowl? Any Kansas City Chiefs fans in here? Yeah. No. No. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. We love you too. Uh, but I just know, right? So you know, all, just like everybody else, all excited about the 49ers, right? Most horrific six minutes. Fourth quarter, which is ugly. And then after the game, what do they all say? They all say, it's okay, we're a young team. We'll do it next year. That's what's going to It's going to be better next year, right? So I thought, well, maybe the week's going to get a little better. Then Tuesday comes. And I watched the State of the Union address. I don't care which side you're on on that. And maybe you didn't even watch it. I don't know. But I know that afterwards... So many people said, it's okay, it's going to be different in November. Once November comes, everything's going to be fine. And you see, the thing is, I know that's not true. I know that there are teams that think they're going to do better than the Super Bowl, and they're not going to get to the Super Bowl, or they're not going to win. I know that people think that when their candidate is elected, it's going to get much better. And even if they win, so many of them are still going to be angry. And why is that? I mean, not, I'm not saying politics is necessarily bad, mostly. Football's necessarily bad. I'm just saying that those are not going to be the things that we can put our trust in that are going to give us fulfillment. It's Monday. I walked into so many people, right, after the Super Bowl. They're like, oh, I don't know what to do. My purpose for living is gone. Kind of joking, right? Now, in every conversation, there was a great opportunity to say, see you Sunday. <laughs> they didn't come. But uh, here's the thing, is that, that I look at this, and I realized that Jesus does something that no one else can. Jesus calls us to our true selves. You notice that he said about Zacchaeus, this man too is the son of Abraham. Now why did he do that? Because he's saying, look, this man too matters to God. Abraham, the father of our faith, the father of many nations, the one who, who set the standard for all of us, the one that we are descendants of because we belong to God. You know what? This man too belongs to God. This man too is the son of Abraham. This man too is precious and valuable just as you are. I was reading Psalm 86 in the Passion Translation and, and more than anything else, it just said, this is who I am. Listen to these words. The psalmist writes, teach me more about you, how you work and how you move, so that I can walk onward in your truth until everything within me brings honor to your name. With all my heart and passion, I will thank you, my God. I will give glory to your name always and forever. You love me so much and you placed your greatness upon me. You rescued me from the deepest place of darkness. You have delivered me from a certain death. But Lord, your nurturing love is tender and gentle. You are slow to get angry yet so swift to show your faithful love. You are full of abounding grace and truth. Bring me to your grace fountain so that your strength becomes mine. Be my hero. I love that. I love that. Be my hero. And come rescue your servant once again. Send me a miraculous sign to show me how much you love me. So that those who hate me will see it and be ashamed. Don't they know that you, Lord, are my comforter? The one who comes to help me? You see, this person knows that their true home is with God. Lord, be my hero. Lord, I want to walk onward in your truth until everything within me brings honor to your name. This is who I am. This is who I was created to be. I know um, we got to go to the daddy-daughter dance last night, right? Uh, my daughters got to go with me. We haven't missed a dance in 21 years, right? I know, 21 years is kind of fun, right? And, and, and so we get there, and, and I'll tell you, it's, it's like transformed, right? First off, the guys who are there dress far better than I've ever seen them any other day of the week, right? Travis, you looked really good last night. Your wife would have been And you look good today, don't get me wrong. But, uh, but, you know, it was just, it was just fun to watch. These, these dads are dressed up, and they are on their best behavior. But then something even more so. I mean, they're treating their daughters like princesses. It's just so fun to watch, right? But then you watch, and they just go nuts, right? I mean, I mean these guys, I didn't even think they had it in them. I mean, there was one guy. Who, what, what does the fox say? Man, he was the fox, right? Or, uh, I mean, just crazy. I just, some of these people come to life, right? Fortunately, I was in a, you know, I'm, I, every time, you know, I'm, 
I stand next to David Mills and Nick Minorsky and Jamie, and I'm watching these guys, and it's, it's like, who are these guys? But I thought, this is who they really are. This is their passion. This is who they are. And, you know, and for, for me, with my daughters, you know, uh, it, it's always so special because they always end the dance with butterfly kisses. And, uh, but they weren't playing it because so many people put in requests. And we were not about to leave until they did butterfly kisses. I mean, my daughters go up and they say, you really like butterfly kisses. Oh, yeah, I'll get to it. And then she says, well, this is the last song. And they play When You Wish Upon a Star. That was not butterfly kisses. <laughs> so I remember uh, there were only like three other couples there, <laughs> right? And, I, and, and so I, I did. I, 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 I did. I pulled the pastor card. I did. I, I, I just went up to her and said, are you going to play butterfly kisses? For my daughters who've never missed it in 21 years. <laughs> and I'll never watch, forget what she said. She said, sure, pastor. <laughs> I am ashamed. But not really, really. <laughs> we were really. And even Cammie's turning on the lights. I'm like, yeah, we're not done yet. We're not leaving till this song goes. <laughs> but I thought, you know, there was so much in me that just said, this is, I just love this moment. And it was such a special time. And I look at this and I think of this, is that, that, that and times like this, I see this is who Jesus made us to be. We draw near to those we love when we are able just to be filled with that joy and that passion and that celebration. And this is who God made us to be. And see, Zacchaeus right then in that moment, Zacchaeus was a man who was, un, who was set free. Right? Can you imagine? Can you imagine the transformation a guy who was probably just not even seen or talked to by any religious person ever, now all of a sudden is coming to his home. He gladly welcomed him because he knew this is what he had been missing. This is the one who could fill the hole in his soul. And Jesus seeks us out. He says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, uh, Jesus tells a story uh, in John chapter 14 about things that were lost because, you see, lost people matter to God. And he starts by telling three stories. Bam, bam, bam. The first story is about a lost sheep and how the shepherd has 99 sheep, but one is missing, the hundredth one is missing. So he, he abandons everything to search for that lost sheep. So valuable was that sheep. And then it goes, bam, next story. And there's a woman who has a coin. It really wasn't a whole lot of money, but it was very precious to her. And so she tears her house upside down in search for this coin. So valuable was it to her to find it. And then the final story, the big one, the kicker, right, is the prodigal son. We all know the story, right? The son who wanted his father's inheritance so he could just blow it on a party. The son who just takes his father's money and goes without turning back. And he has lots of friends until his money runs out. And you know where the story goes from there. I mean, he's so destitute, he's working for a pig farmer and eating the pig slop. And he finally wakes up and comes to his senses and says, oh man, even if I go back to my father's home, I know it won't let me be a servant, but that's got to be better than this. And so he just starts the journey home because he has been gone and he's been gone for a while and he's been far away from his father. Then my favorite part of the story, it says, he starts coming towards the home and the story goes this way, it says, but while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him and started running towards him with open arms. And his son started to give his well-rehearsed speech, right? And he started to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and earth. His father says, my son is home. And he wraps him in his arms and he holds him close. And he says, let's celebrate. It was better than the daddy-daughter dance. Though if Carolyn can't even been there, it would have been better. But I'm just saying. And so here's the thing. <laughs> here's the thing. This is the heart of God. If you want to know what God thinks of you, if you say, I am too far away for God to embrace me, you just need to know that Jesus is waiting, just as he was for Zacchaeus, just as he is for you, with open arms, because nothing you have done will let God love you any less, and nothing you have done will make God love you any more. And see, Jesus comes, and he comes to seek and to save that which is lost, because Jesus knows we lost. The problem is some of the times we don't even realize it. And Jesus comes and he saves us from our lostness. I wonder if Revelation was written and responded to Zacchaeus. I don't think so, but it's there. Revelation 3.20 says, Here I am, Jesus says. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. You see, Jesus gives our life a greater purpose. 
Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It doesn't, Jesus doesn't say, I will show you the way. I will show you the truth. I will show you the life. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. The key is sought. The question is, do we? And then we see that Jesus gives us an eternal and secure destination. In John 10, Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. You say, what do you mean never perish? We all die. But see, that's the point. That is not the end. We put our faith and trust in Jesus. You see, he's saying, you will be with me not just in this life, but the next for all eternity. We think of life as this and eternity like this. Jesus says, this life is so short and here's eternity. And heaven is not a consolation prize. And Jesus says, look, this is what life like, is like in my name. This is what happens when you open the door to me. And Zacchaeus saw that, and that's why Zacchaeus, all of a sudden, everything changes for him because he realized Jesus was his salvation, the one he'd been waiting for, the one he'd been hoping for, the only one who could fill the hole in his soul. Romans 10 says this, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so, I, I know I've gone a little long today, but I, I, just, I just want to end with this question. Will you gladly welcome Jesus into your home today? Because I believe he's knocking. I believe that's why you're here. And I think that's the question that Zacchaeus answered. He welcomed him gladly. And oh, my friends, my prayer for you is that you would not listen to the voices of other people who mutter and tell you that you'll only be a sinner. That you will not just be caught up in, in your seeking for fulfillment through other things that never satisfy. But that you will see that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And the greatest thing you can do is open the door and let him in. And when they read this passage, I see that there is no question. You wonder, if I open the door, is he going to walk away? No. When you open the door, it doesn't matter what he finds inside, he's coming in because he wants to be in your home. I think that's why it's so fun for me with this new members, and to have you both become new members today, right? Because this is home now. And that was a big statement for you. And I just think, this is where I want to be in God's house. And I know that there are other churches around, and I know there are other ways we can do it, but, but today, this day, this is home. Because we came here because I think we wanted something different. Maybe we're hoping, hoping that Jesus would meet us today. And here's the answer. He's been knocking on the door the whole time. It hasn't been a question of whether he's willing, it's a question of whether you will open the door. And that's what today is all about.